talking primarily about celiac disease today specifically, but I often find it very useful to begin these talks by kind of extending the scope of that idea a bit further to also include this idea of neurological problems which are still happening due to gluten sensitivity, but which don't necessarily need to occur alongside celiac disease at the same time. These are relatively rare presentations, um, but they're still very important and useful to kind of get an orientation point on. So on the left here is what we would call gluten ataxia. There's a number of different forms of ataxia. Ataxias are disorders of the part of the brain known as the cerebellum, um, which for various causes undergoes a large amount of atrophy, and this causes lots of problems, and the cerebellum is kind of essential in processing of movement and coordination. So in this particular scan of someone who has ataxia due to underlying gluten sensitivity, we can see that their cerebellum is very much not as big as it should be. There's also another phenotype called gluten cephalopathy, um, which doesn't necessarily involve the cerebellum so much. It involves the top part of the brain, the cerebrum, and doing another kind of MRI scanning, we can see a lot of what we would call white matter lesions, these blobs, which in this particular scan are actually very severe and very expansive that essentially should not be there. The symptoms that we expect to see as a consequence of these reflect quite cleanly the parts of the brain which have been affected. So with the cerebellum being involved, as expected, we will see patients who have difficulty walking, movement and coordination. Some of these patients end up wheelchair bound. Um, the more that the cerebral white matter is involved, the more we see issues of cognition, foggy brain, uh, bad headaches, these sorts of things. So the way that I like to think about this is that there is a kind of a single broad phenomenon, which is gluten sensitivity. This can affect the gut, it can affect the brain, and it can also, of course, affect the skin as well. Um, but rather than being, these being completely clean individual diagnoses are, are separate from one another, what we really have is a spectrum of kind of interplay between them. They can affect one system to a clear and obvious degree, and when it does, we can give a name to that. So obviously, if the gut is affected very badly with clear enteropathy, we call that celiac disease. Uh, if the skin is affected, we call that dermatitis epitiformis. And if the brain is affected to a substantial enough degree, we can call that gluten ataxia or encephalopathy. So lastly, before I talk about these experiments, I just want to address what is always a bit of like an elephant in the room with these things, which is general acceptance and awareness of how the brain can be involved in gluten sensitivity. In the UK, we have this healthcare body called NICE, um, who basically write the gold standard reference points for patient care and treatment for any and all conditions, essentially. So if something you've done makes it into the NICE guideline, that's a real sort of well done sticker, you know, that you can get. Um, and NICE guidelines now do um, directly reference that celiac disease involves a number of non-GI symptoms that can involve neuropathy and ataxia. Um, and also now outright recommend that if you have a patient with otherwise unexplained neuropathy or ataxia, it's a recommendation to do serological testing for celiac disease. So this is very good, but it's also only one half of that coin that I've been trying to talk about. This still frames everything around celiac disease specifically and the serology and GI presentation of that that you'd also expect. It's not yet acknowledging this can still be due to gluten, even if the person is also not diagnosable with celiac disease necessarily. Although that these neurological manifestations have been described, there are still diagnostic delays that can result in permanent neurological disability. Um, these are attributed to controversies which arise from variation in reported prevalence and poor understanding of the use of appropriate serological testing. There's a couple points here which I think they really nail. First of all is the need to get these diagnoses correct because the brain does not recover from injury in the same way that the gut can do. Uh, you can, we can kind of learn our ways around some injury that's happened and show some improvement, but generally speaking, things that physically happen to the brain stay the same way afterwards. So it's important that people who would benefit from treatment, the gluten-free diet and so on, are identified at an earliest point as possible and given that advice. And secondly, this latter sentence kind of gets to what I think the heart of the issue is here, which is not quite understanding the right way to try and identify these problems. And this is particularly pertinent in the literature because, you know, th this was a systematic review of outright ataxia or neuropathy. These are quite blunt problems. If you have full-blown diagnosable neurological ataxia, you are fairly progressed with a condition already to have reached that point. 
but there is a large spectrum of neurological health that exists before that. And a lot of the framing of this often seems to go, do you have ataxia? No, well, we're not interested. But there's a whole range of things that happened before that point which is still relevant to the brain and is absolutely relevant to the patient's experience of the world as well. You know, it's a very common anecdote of someone who kind of feels that something's not quite right within themselves, but you know, the medical tests don't quite show you that you're bad enough yet to be referred appropriately and so on. So the first experiment I want to discuss is one which was published a couple of years ago um, where we attempted to validate this issue in patients with celiac disease. So we got access to a study uh, we have in the UK called the UK Biobank, and we see these sorts of findings in other people's data. Um, we identified volunteers with celiac disease who were otherwise healthy. There was a very long list of exclusion criteria and other conditions. Uh, they were not to be taking any medication which, was, which could affect the functioning of the brain at the time of data collection, and they also had to have brain imaging available as well. And there were 104 such cases in this cohort at the time when we conducted the experiment. We then matched them in a one to two ratio to healthy controls on a range of different criteria. Um, not listed here, but we did also check that uh, smoking frequency and alcohol intake were also the same between two groups and they were not significantly different either. Um, so we're trying to control for vascular risk factors here as well, which can also affect the brain in similar ways to what we were then going on to be studying. And we then just wanted to perform a series of case control analyses. We just wanted to see if there's any evidence that the celiac disease group were a bit on the back foot in terms of you know, the brain scans or the cognitive performance. So we looked at key scores from five different cognitive tests. We looked at responses which were given to six different questions which explored aspects of mental health. And we also did some brain imaging analyses, the center point of which was using this kind of advanced imaging. This is a very good thing to use, not just because it's colorful and, and looks pretty, um, it's used very, it's very popular within all sorts of neuroimaging research. So, you know, it's everywhere in dementia, in Parkinson's, in stroke. It's a very kind of well adopted scanning technique. And it is very popular because the measurements we get from this are very sensitive at picking up on kind of relatively early physical changes to the white matter of the brain, which are maybe not yet detectable on other forms of imaging and it has very good uh, reproducibility as well compared to some other kinds of imaging also. So in terms of the results, we did indeed find that the uh, patients with celiac disease in this cohort had slower reaction time significantly compared to the match controls, and they were significantly more likely to give responses to these multiple choice questions that explored quality of life and mental health, um, and those were true of the questions looking at anxiety, depression, um, thoughts of self-harm, and perhaps not quite so surprisingly how happy they were with the state of their own health. In terms of the imaging analysis, we did then find that uh, one of our metrics from the diffusion tensor imaging was significantly different in a number of areas in the brain between the two groups. So what we're looking at here in the background is kind of like a template brain, um, and anything that's green is showing kind of the core of a white matter tract that is not significantly different in measurement between the two groups. The green areas are the same, they're not of interest. But anywhere that has a kind of like a red to yellow blob um, is a location where this measurement is significantly changed. And this is taken to show a kind of like a ground truth physical difference in the structure of the white matter between the celiac disease patients compared to the controls. And when you have this alongside a deficit in things like reaction time, it builds, I think, a very clear picture of you know, a physical shift, which has led to a tangible cognitive outcome as well. So with it established, hopefully, that you know, this is an issue that we should be paying attention to, I'm going to talk briefly now about what actually are the symptoms we might see in patients with celiac disease, how frequently do they occur, um, and is there anything we can look at which might predict risk of these happening in some patients more than others? So this is now another experiment which was published a couple of years ago, but which was using data from around 2015, I think. Um, we recruited 100 patients with celiac disease from our gastroenterology department. None of them had any history of neurological disorders, and they were all recruited at the point of their initial diagnosis as well. So the point of all this is that there's a real effort made to get you know, a, a typical, if you will, celiac disease group at the earliest point of their diagnosis, at a very early point in their disease course. All subjects, we just looked to characterize the cohort. They all underwent a neurological examination. They self-reported problems they felt that they had. 
Um, we did blood sera testing for a variety of things, but including this transglutaminase 6, which we're wondering might be a bit of a predictor for glutenataxia, and we also did some brain imaging as well. In terms of the symptoms, the red blobs are what was found on clinical examination, and the blue blobs are what was self-reported. There's a variety of different things that seem to fall down the lines mostly of balance, headache, and sensory symptoms. So 10% had signs of peripheral neuropathy, 29% were noted to have some level of kind of difficulty walking, and 11% had nystagmus, which is uh, like an eye twitch um, sort of problem you can induce on, on examination. Um, and then in terms of self-reporting, it kind of matched up quite nicely. A quarter of the group reported some difficulty with balance, headaches were very frequent, and lastly, there were some sensory symptoms. And I think a nice summary for this is that even after you exclude the headaches, because headaches are very nonspecific, you could still say that exactly half of the group had at least one sign or symptom of possible neurological dysfunction here. In terms of the brain imaging study, um, I then wanted essentially to see if those patients who also did have TG6 antibodies on top of the diagnosis seem to be at any additional risk of kind of neurological complications. There wasn't much that came out from this in terms of looking at how symptoms fell down these lines, but the brain imaging was very interesting. So 40% of these subjects did have TG6 antibodies, so it's almost half of the group also uh, this was true for them. And sure enough, those that did um, had lower brain volume in a couple of regions in the brain. Um, so first of all, in the cerebellum, uh, and then also that as, as a general effect, that is across all of the cerebellar gray matter, that's where that number was, was kind of taken from. And then we also did kind of like a first pass investigation looking at the total volume of subcortical gray matter, which are gray matter regions in the top half of the brain. Um, and we did find an effect there. And when you looked at that more deeply, looking at which subcortical region is it driving that, it was the thalamus. What's of interest here is that uh, in the previous experiment I was discussing, where we got these white matter tract differences, they were very much focused on the tract that connects the cerebellum to the thalamus from the biobank data. And then in this study, we're finding apparently the two regions which might be at risk of atrophy are the cerebellum and the thalamus as well. So we're starting to build a little bit of like a synergistic picture between these different experiments now. Lastly, experiment two and a half, we did a follow-up on this data much more recently. So how do these symptoms change over time? Is there any evidence that the gluten-free diet can help progression, which I'm sure is something we're all very interested to know about at these sorts of talks? So talking about COVID interfering with things, it was meant to be 50 of these patients who reattended, uh, but there was a spanner in the works <laughs> in various different ways. We wound up having 30 of these patients who reattended a mean of seven years later after that initial assessment. And they essentially underwent all the same investigations again. Uh, the scans, importantly, were performed on the same scanner using the same sequences, which is always a consideration that needs to be made for these things because small differences in hardware or software can produce artificial sort of differences in results. Um, and with it already being established that cerebellar gray matter and the thalamus are regions of interest, uh, the volume of these areas were kind of reassessed at both time points the differences between them were taken, and then ultimately that number was kind of split by the actual length of time that had passed between the two scans for each patient. So what we're, the number at the end of it is a yearly percentage brain volume loss for the thalamus and for the cerebellum. That's what we're going to be looking at. Exactly half of the cohort had achieved negativity of all gluten-related antibodies. I think in an ideal world, you would want to look at how differences progress over time by each individual antibody. But with the relatively small sample size we have, we were kind of forced here to go, well, let's just create two groups, half of which still have at least one antibody present and half of which who have achieved total negativity. Progression of symptoms over time is a real mixed bag. Um, so needless to say, the baseline percentages are the baseline of this 30, not the baseline of the 100, you know, from, from the previous experiment. A couple of things appear to get better. You know, headaches are less frequent now. Nystagmus is apparently a bit better. There was one fewer people, uh, person that that happened in. But just as readily, some things appear to have worsened over time as well, and a couple of things appear to have been stable. We were able to show, however, I was very excited by this in the brain imaging, 
um, there was nothing in the thalamus, but the, the rate of atrophy in the cerebellum was indeed greater, statistically speaking, year to year, in the half of the patients who were still positive for an antibody compared to the half which were not. So in the group of patients who had achieved negativity of antibodies, they were losing 0.32% of cerebellar volume in the gray matter a year. And this was over double in the other group who were losing a mean of 0.73% each year of the cerebellum. This is very exciting for me because the, there are a handful of studies out there, you know, kind of like demonstrating these kind of statistical differences. But this is the first time, to my knowledge, that brain imaging has been used to show a tangible benefit, apparently, of, well, strict following the gluten-free diet, at least to the point of achieving in, in immunological negativity, which I know is the objective of doing that, that this does appear to confer a benefit. Of course, what's missing from this is a control group. Um, you know, we're not able to say that it's completely arrested progression, just that it's better in one group than the other. It would be great to also have a control group to add to this slide as well. So that's a bit for future research. <laughs> so just to bring it all together, uh, brain and cognitive changes are detectable in patients with celiac disease, even when we use third-party data and population data. This really helps validate that this is a problem and is something which needs to be kind of fully adopted and accepted, I think. Um, the sorts of symptoms which might be expected, uh, neurologically speaking, um, include headache, foggy brain, uh, some coordination, some sensory problems. These mirror quite nicely in, as a kind of a microcosm of the sorts of things which we see at a much more severe level in these rarer cases of people who have very severe kind of strictly neurological presentations of these. Um, which kind of raises questions, I think, of, you know, all this sort of shared disease mechanism. Perhaps are celiac disease patients, quote unquote, lucky in receiving a relatively early diagnosis and then going on a diet which helps things get, helps things not get worse? Um, all good questions. Um, and finally, there is evidence that a gluten-free diet does help this progression over time. Uh, but more research is needed, which lastly brings me to the collaboration, which Beyond Celiac has uh, very generously started with us. Um, I mentioned this clinic which we have where we see patients who, you know, who do have these extreme neurological presentations. Over the years we've had over a thousand such patients in the course of their regular clinical care. We'll have multiple scans from multiple different time points, serological tests galore, you know, notes on physiological, electrophysiology recordings. We're also collecting new data as well. Uh, there's a postal, postal questionnaire on diet adherence and mood which has now been getting posted out, and that's going to form the basis for an abstract to the uh, celiac disease symposium at the end of this month. Um, ultimately, we want to combine all of this and do some really high-powered, in-depth analyses by disease subgroups, by serological results. How does all of this really progress over time? What factors ameliorate things in the middle of this? Ultimately, is the gluten-free diet enough, and how does it affect the patient's quality of life at the end of it? So what is Beyond Celiac doing about this? Well, we are funding the science that's gonna lead us to treatments and a cure for celiac disease. We're funding the best research that goes from the bench, that means from the scientists, to the bedside, so that we can be able to live life to the fullest. At Beyond Celiac, we have the passion, the people, and the science to be the catalyst for treatments and a cure for celiac disease. And we have hope. Please, please join us and support us. Go to beyondciliac.org, join in the cause, and help fund our projects.